Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. This is yours truly, Pastor Kevin L.A. Ewing, coming to you once again with another live episode of the Spiritual Insight Show. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, I have a beautiful, beautiful treat for you today, an awesome teaching. For those of you that follow me, of course, you would have seen it. I posted uh, a little over an hour ago. But before I get into that teaching, I would have done uh, two other teachings uh, this week. And I highly recommend that you go and uh, pay some attention to it. The one that I did uh, a day ago was Spiritual Rules uh, of Engagement. I think you need to take a look at that. And the other one was Continue Doing What is Right Despite the Opposition. Both of them are filled with uh, spiritual advice, spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, uh, something that I think you should pay great attention to, especially in these difficult, trying, and tempting times. <clears throat> and you need every piece of knowledge and wisdom possible to make your way through these difficult moments. All right? Uh, I'm just going to jump right into it because I've got quite a bit to cover. So again, we're dealing with the topic today, deeper revelation into the world of monitoring spirits. I labeled it that way because I did... Uh, Actually, I did a couple teachings on this before, plus I've written a few articles on it also. But today, we're going to take it a step further. We're going to take it a step further, and of course, as usual with all my teachings, uh, this is going to be riddled with scriptures. So my advice to you right now is to get a pen, a recorder, a paper, whatever, because I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures so that you, like I always tell you, can go and check it out for yourself. You don't have to believe me. In fact, it don't matter if you believe me, <laughs> believe the scriptures. Go and read the scriptures. We're gonna forensically go into the scriptures and extract the wisdom that God has put there for all of us, all right? I trust you guys are having a wonderful weekend. I certainly am, and I'm gonna have an even greater one after this teaching today, all right? So let me just put up my uh, Bible here on this phone here. Okay, here we go. All right, so deeper revelation into the world of monitoring spirits. First of all, for those of you that do not know, because I'm sure you're asking, what is a monitoring spirit? For those that do know, and for some of you that read your Bible, your second question should be, is the phrase monitoring spirit in the Bible? All right, and I will answer both of them respectively. All right, mm -hmm. to monitor, let's use that word first. The word monitor means to observe and to check the progress or quality of something or someone over a period of time. It also means to maintain regular surveillance over someone or something. So in layman's term, we're talking about, in this case, because we're talking about monitoring spirits, we're talking about invisible, <coughs> excuse me, invisible, or disembodied entities that literally watch consistently, <coughs> excuse me, human beings. No, I should have brought my water. Right, so they watch human beings consistently. Now, the human beings would not know this. However, <coughs> excuse me, there have been signs in the victim's life that I would reveal later on in this teaching that is clear evidence that you are being monitored. And just to jump out of the block, every human being has a monitoring spirit. Everyone. Just like there's an angel assigned to every believer, every human being has a monitoring spirit. And again, all of these claims that I'm making, I will prove to you clearly in Scripture. So again, the word monitor literally means to observe and to check the progress or quality of something or someone over a period of time. The second definition is to maintain regular surveillance over something or someone. So when we talk about a monitoring spirit, while the Bible will not say monitoring spirit, you will see all the evidence of it. We label it that way. Just like how you see a person who have a jealous spirit or a lustful spirit or uh, a, a lying spirit. Some of those terminologies you will not see in the Bible. So what do we do when we don't see these things verbatim in Scripture? 
we then go and look for the principles that they are based upon so that we'll be consistent with our doctrine as it relates to scripture. So we're not pulling something out of our heart here. What we're gonna do, like I'm telling you now, I'm gonna give you a cadre of scriptures to prove this particular entity that literally not only follows but invade the lives of human beings. Now, what is their true purpose? Well, there are several. The main purpose of a monitoring spirit is to record, not just follow, but to record everything as it relates to their victim. What they do, how they do it, who they're doing it with, and the purpose of this will be the same reason why it's done in physical wars. And that is to retain as much information as possible about your enemy so that you can now strategically set up an ambushment against them or to set up how you're gonna destroy them based on the information that you have about them. So this is why Satan assigns spirits to people to monitor them. Now I wanna be clear from the get-go. Monitoring spirit, let me be clear here. Every spirit, and if I can want you to write this down, every spirit from the kingdom of darkness, you probably never heard this before, is classified as a monitoring spirit. While there is a monitoring spirit or a group of evil forces that are monitoring, every spirit, whether it's a spirit of hate, offense, bitterness, lust, whatever, those spirits have dual functions. The function that they assign, such as lying, stealing, whatever, but they also monitor the individual in whom they are oppressing or possessing. So when you hear the term familiar spirit, masquerading spirit, lustful spirit, or whatever type demonic spirit, that spirit also has a dual role. It is also uh, responsible for monitoring and recording what this person is doing. That's very, very important to know because you're gonna see me using some terminologies throughout this teaching, but it's gonna be interchangeable with the monitoring spirit, okay? Again, while there is a specific monitoring spirit, the reality is that all evil spirits can be classified as monitoring spirit. Again, such as familiar spirit, masquerading spirit, spirit of jealousy, and so on. Now, a masquerading spirit is a spirit that can literally change their forms, okay? Whether it's to, a, and mostly you will see these in dreams. And again, I will speak on this today also where the spirit shows up in your dream as a deceased loved one. The person has already died, has already died, but yet they're appearing in your dream. So as far as you're concerned, that is your deceased husband or your deceased uncle who just recently passed. But this is not so as we will prove in scripture. What this is, is a spirit that's masquerading or taking on the form of that particular loved one to deceive the victim because the intent of all of this recording and watching and su surveillance on the victim is to ultimately destroy the victim but the monitoring is that they would have accurate information about this person how they eat what they eat what they like to eat what sins that they love to participate in these are the things that the kingdom of darkness are going to zoom in on as it relates to the victim to destroy that victim. So they're not just watching you because they have nothing to do, they're watching you to destroy you, all right? These spirits monitor what you do, how you do it, what you say, and who you associate yourselves with. The primary purpose is to record everything about the victim for future use in destroying the victim's life. The idea is to prevent the victim from fulfilling the will of God for their lives. So. Let me lay this out to you right now. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, and you've been saved for a while, right, right, a while, there's been no progress, there's been no advancement, you are no different than the day before you got saved. The only difference is you call yourself a Christian. What is causing that? 
monitoring spirits. Monitoring spirits has distracted you. Monitoring spirits have delayed you, have hindered you. They come in the form of generational curses. They come in the form of bad habits. They come in the form of causing you to connect with people whom they know will not cause you to go forward in life. For example, a person, there are people who are getting married today. God did not put these people together. The monitoring spirits did. And they did it because they know in the end this union will secure divorce at the end road. So the spirits are to, to make you focus on the physical parts of life so that you will never know it is them that is orchestrating this evil in your life. Monitoring spirits, as a relate, like I said earlier, when it comes to generational curses, they, they, they played a, a major role in generational curses because they are the ones who were totally familiar with this family, totally familiar with the behavioral patterns of this family. So therefore, whatever generational curses levied on that family, be it uh, a spirit of having children out of wedlock, uh, the family members are never able to achieve marriage, or they are consistent with divorce. Well, it is these spirits that are responsible for maintaining such uniform negative behavior in the family. I'm going to take my time with this because I really want you to get it. And, and I don't want you to believe I don't have no scriptures, but I have tons of it. But I'm going to get into that a little bit. I just want to lay the, the foundation out right now. So there are people right now who are battling with certain sins or certain vices, right? And they would tell you, uh, let's use drugs, for example. Kevin, I tried my best to stop drugs. I could go one or two days, but even when I do that, I, it, like something viciously come upon me and give me this insatiable desire that I would literally sell my family to, 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 to buy crack cocaine or what have you. Okay, listen to what they said. Feel it. I feel like something is on me, pressuring me or forcing me. Right. That's that spirit right there. That monitoring spirit uh, slash addictive or addiction spirit on you. Their job is to, like I said, to, to record, to ensure that they are fully the kingdom of darkness. When they pull the file of Kevin or you or John or Mary, your cousin, they're pulling and they're pulling up the sins, the, 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 the secret sins, the evil sins, the things that they, they preach one thing over here, but they do something over here in the dark. All of these things are being recorded. Again, the purpose of it is to now strategize how are we going to shut this person down? How are we going to delay their lives? How are we going to cause them not to go forward in life? All right? So, again, all evil spirits can be classified as monitoring spirits because their master, okay, Satan, neither themselves are omnipresent or omniscient. Now, these two words are going to be key in this teaching, right? So let's define them. The word omnipresent means to be present everywhere all the time. So remember the context. The reason why, the purpose of these things, why it's happening, why Satan as well as these, these guys are doing it, these evil spirits, is because they cannot be omnipresent. They are not omnipresent. Only God is. So Satan cannot be everywhere all the time. So therefore, he has to dispatch his evil spirits, whatever form they're in, and they're the one that's gathering the intelligence as it relates to the victim in whom they're surveying or, 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 or watching. The second word is the word omniscient. Omniscient is defined as knowing everything. Satan does not know everything. Therefore, he has to rely on his monitoring spirits to bring him information. So when they sit down in their conference rooms and they pull up your file or my file and the information is given to him or whomever, then they now strategize how we're going to shut this person down. So let's just back up a little bit. What this is saying is that nothing in your life, especially evil stuff, is happening by accident. It's a concerted effort by evil powers to destroy your life. Now, write this down. 
the power of monitoring spirits, the power of the kingdom of darkness is to remain unaware to the victim. So, for example, there are people right now, listen to me. Here, listen, listen to me on the radio, talking about monitoring spirit. Where I can find that in the Bible? They're all about making up foolishness now. Right. So Satan got them. That same person right there, right? Because the idea, remember, let's go back to the rules. The Bible says, uh, Proverbs 11 verse 9b, that through knowledge, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. So Satan effort to conquer you, what does he have to do? Break your legs? No. Punch you in the eye? No. Well, what does he have to do? Ensure that they don't ever come into such knowledge. Let them go about life on their limited knowledge. And it is what they don't know that the enemy will use to shut them down. There are people right now, they have no idea. Let me, let me just give you an example of how powerful knowledge is. There are probably a couple right now somewhere in this world. They just met each other, uh, head over heels for each other, and the other party have no idea that the other party has is HIV positive. The person who's HIV positive is fully aware. So what they're doing, because of their ignorance to this person's condition, they're carrying on with a regular relationship. They'll probably uh, get together sexually and so on and so forth and, and have no thought of such a thing. So this is, this is another example of where the Bible says that my people perish because they lack knowledge. But that's straight across the board. There was a foolish uh, statement uh, I used to hear years ago, and it goes like this what you don't know won't hurt you. You're absolutely right. Would you absolutely right? What you don't know will kill you though. <laughs> okay, you're right, it wouldn't hurt you, it'll kill you. So it is what you don't know, and this is the premises that this branch of the kingdom of darkness uh, is relying on. So Satan is not God, neither are his evil minions. So they cannot be everywhere all the time, and they're not all knowing. So how do we supplement this? How do we, we, we fix this? Well, we fix this by creating a branch in our kingdom that is gonna be responsible for gathering information on everyone that we're uh, watching over. And then we're gonna bring that information back to now Console over as to how we're going to target this person's life. This is going to get very, very powerful. So the word omniscient is defined as knowing everything. All right? Now, there are five common ways in which these spirits are deployed. Now we're going into scripture now. All right? Now, it isn't limited to this five. There are many ways, but these are the most uh, predominant uh, ways in which they're deployed, okay? So the first one is through objects, all right? Through objects. Now, what do you mean by that, Kevin? Now, the old bear workers out there will know what I'm talking about, <laughs> okay? The witchcraft kings and queens out there, they know just what I'm about to say. There are certain items that a person would give you, but these items are curse, or there are things that, or rituals that has been performed, or spells invoke on these items. It could be a gift someone gave you or whatever. But the minute you brought that on your property, there are some things that started to, to happen. But for the most part, you can be monitored via that because there's a spirit attached to that item. And I'm gonna give you scripture now to prove it, but I just wanna elaborate on it a little bit more before I get there. So this item, which is a curse item, and curse simply mean that well, in essence, in this case, it's property of the kingdom of darkness, but this is also a surveillance item. Now, like I said, every spirit is classified in terms of demonic, is classified as a monitoring spirit. But whatever their main function is, this is where they become dual in their activity. For example, they would have sent that there to bring division in your home. But the same spirit of division is also double agent 
a monitoring spirit because it gives information back to the kingdom on what these people are doing, how this curse is activating in their life, what is the pro pro progress and the quality of this curse going on in their lives. So all of this has happened from a spiritual perspective. So the advantage of the kingdom of darkness in this case is that the victim is completely ignorant to what's going on. Completely ignorant. God forbid if they know nothing about the Bible, they know nothing about the spiritual world. So anyone who speak against these things or bring knowledge, then they're quick to refute or challenge or dismiss such information, which of course works for the enemy because he understands the law of destruction. And the law of destruction is that these people will be destroyed. It's a guarantee as long as they are void of this knowledge. I'm trying to help you. So, so someone could give you an item. I've had many people sit before me, especially married couples, and told me how they, you know, had their wedding and certain um, member of either family gave an unusual gift. But ever since they had that gift, all sorts of weird stuff started to go on. Not only that, there would be a particular family member, I could think of one case right now, and it was like whatever they discuss in their home, only these couple lived there, this family member, whenever they came by and start conversation, they would speak about the things that this couple has discussed. Now, what was interesting was that this family member who was doing this claimed to be a prophetess, right? So these two people who are totally ignorant of the gift that she gave them to the wedding and has it in their house and listening spiritually, which they call divination, she have, they have no idea of this. So of course she would take advantage of this and say, the Lord, tell me there's some things you all been contemplating in terms of entrepreneurial stuff and, and I hear God says that he can make that thing. So to them, oh my God, she on point, mighty God. They have no idea, they have no idea of the spiritual order, the demonic order that's going on there. None of that. So whatever went bad to that place, this family member was able to tell them in advance because what she sent there when she gave them that particular item was supposed to do these things. Same thing as a false prophet. A false prophet, true divinations, are hearing from familiar spirits, same thing as monitoring spirits, and now giving information that it has retrieved from the monitoring spirit of the victim they're speaking to. So this is why you hear them say, oh, I hear God, and they'll pause for a moment because they're waiting on the spirit to tell them, give me information. So how am I gonna notice a monitoring spirit? Because the majority of the prophecies that are being told is superficial foolishness. For example, uh, to prove to you that I'm a prophet, uh, uh, you have a yellow car, and in and, and your car right now, there's a teddy bear in the back seat and it belongs to your second daughter. What does this have to do with Jesus Christ? What does this have to do with salvation? What does this have to do with the Bible? Absolutely nothing. So let's make the comparison. Let's go to the Bible and let's do a survey on all the prophets and let's see which prophet or any prophet that wanted to prove to the people they're prophesying to, they told them, uh, uh, the socks that you're wearing right now, I can't see it, but it's a yellow sock. And, and when you leave from here, you're going to pass two donkeys and, and who did that? So a false prophet who is operating through these means, their first job is to convince you. The way they do that is by retrieving information from the spirit whom they have contract with. And that process is called divination, where they're communicating illegally from the spiritual realm via demonic forces. There's a spirit, monitoring one of course, speaking to their familiar spirit, advising them of these things. Now sometimes it could get confusing because there could be two people standing together whom this false prophet will come to. But the information that's coming isn't about the one that they're talking to, but the one next to them. So you'll say, you have a blue car. No, I don't, I don't have a blue car. You sure? Because I see a blue car with four doors. No, I don't. Then the person next door put up the hand, but I, I have a blue car with four doors. So you see how the confusion could come. So let's go now to Joshua chapter 6. 
we're going to see now how monitoring spirits can be attached to items, okay? So let's go to Joshua chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 17 to verse 18. Verse 17 to verse 18. This is vital knowledge. You need to know this because it is stuff like this that you're void of that's putting your life in a circle. You're going around the same mountain over and over. So Joshua chapter 6, verse 17. And of course, this is about the Jericho wall. God gave them instructions, what they needed to do, the uh, protocol that he gave them to circle the city. On the seventh day, you do X, Y, Z. But he says, now before all that happened, listen to these specific instructions. And, it's, and it says, and the city shall be, right, and the city shall be a curse. Which city is he talking about? Jericho. So he just finished telling them what to do in order for the walls to supernaturally collapse. Now he's saying the city of Jericho is a cursed city. And it's, the word is A-C-C-U-R-S-E-D. Now I went and looked up that word in its original Hebrew rendering. And it means something. One of the meaning is something that is marked specifically for destruction. So let's read it now. Joshua 6 verse 17. Verse 17. And the city shall be a curse, mark for destruction, even it and all that are therein. To the Lord only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. Verse 18 of Joshua 6. Listen carefully. And ye, meaning the children of Israel, in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. So, so far, the Bible is telling us Jericho and its inhabitants are all cursed, inclusive of the items in there, the sheets, the pans, everything. Every one of those things, it basically is like a, a mini dictatorship. Everything belongs to the state. So, every one of those items attached to them are curses or evil spirits that are on them. They are marked for the destruction, but not only destruction, remember I tell you, those evil spirit serves dual roles, meaning that they are a spirit for their specific function, lying, stealing, cheating, offense, whatever, but they are also monitoring spirits because they have to report to the kingdom of darkness, right? So verse 18 of Joshua 6 says, And ye, children of Israel, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Least, meaning if you take a hold of it, least ye make yourselves accursed. So if you take this, this item here, where they did some mojo on, the Bible is saying by you accepting it. Now why is this? Because remember what I said to you, even in dreams. When you accept these things, you are by default agreeing with whatever that is. Meaning that, am I going to bring you in my home? Am I going to accept this item from you? I'm going to eat this food from you? I'm agreeing unknowingly to the covenant, to this evil that I'm unaware of. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Least, listen, you make yourselves accursed. But it doesn't end there. Remember, these are spiritual laws. These are spiritual rules. So from a spiritual warfare perspective... It is showing us the power of the kingdom of darkness when we operate in ignorance, or more importantly, when we operate in disobedience to God. I told you not to take it, but you took it. Now watch the spiritual implications that comes along with my disobedience. He says, not only will you be a curse, the one who took it, not only will you be marked for destruction, but I'm reading here, it says, Least you make yourselves a curse when you take of the accursed thing and and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. So he's saying that if I take this item from this no good family member who went to wickedness, right? And I bring it to my home innocently. The Bible is saying these are spiritual rules. This is not my opinion. This is not how I feel. I gave you the scripture. Read it for yourself. When I take this, not only did Whatever this curse represents will afflict me. But the inhabitants of my home, who didn't accept it, but by proximity, they will now be part of this curse. 
I trying to help you. I trying to help you. That's why I repeat to you in every teaching session, let me give you the rules. Let me give you the spiritual principles. Let me give you the laws. You know why? Because from that point forward, this have nothing to do with Kevin's opinion. This have nothing to do. These are the rules. You could believe it or not believe it. You could adhere to it or reject it. But this is how it operates. Why? Think about it. Think about some of you who lived in a home where people either practiced sorcery or in an, in an, similar to this instance, they collected something that was cursed. As long as you stayed or reside in that home, you never ever prospered. The minute you leave and when get your own place or when live somewhere else, your life took off like nobody business. Why? Because of this rule right here. They're trying to help you. They're trying to help you. So this way in which these monitoring spirits are deployed is through curse items. All right. The second way is through animals. Oh, I bring in this baby home today. Oh, yeah. Many of you could relate to this. Many of you. When there's a monitoring spirit that has been dispatched to you, all right? In this instance, they deployed it in an animal. Many of you can tell me right now. Uh, certain creatures infesting your home, right? I've had many stories. I've actually experienced these things myself. For example, this particular bird that will pop up on your property at uh, certain hours of the night and just stands dormant, staring in your home direction, all right? If not that, you have ravens or crows or blackbirds lining on your wall or your fence or the power lines, all of a sudden just staring in your direction, all right? You have an infestation of roaches in your place. Infestation of rats, very strange, okay? You're trying to figure out what, what are these things? Monitoring spirits, monitoring spirits. Okay, but I don't believe that. You don't believe it? Okay, let's try this one. Let's go to the infestation of the, the roaches or, or these little insects coming in your place. All of a sudden, especially centipedes and so on. Do this for me. Go before God and pray and say, Father, I pray that every monitoring spirit that has infiltrated my home, I pray that you destroy it in the name of Jesus. Now you wake up the next morning, come out of your room and go in your kitchen or go in the living room. All of these roaches and stuff dead on your floor, on their back. You didn't spray no spray. You didn't bring in the pest company guy. You did none of that. It was only after that prayer. But I know you feel uh, Kevin talking on the set, so let's go to the scripture. That's why I like to go. Let's go to the scripture. Is it possible? Is it possible that a spirit could be deployed in an animal and operate in that animal? Oh, of course. Does the Bible say so? Oh, yes. Let's go to the scripture. I love it. So let's go to Mark. Let's go to the book of Mark. I love it. Mark chapter 5. And we're going to read from verse 8, Mark chapter 5, from verse 8 to verse 13. All right? I love knowledge. I love it. Mark chapter 5, verse 8. Now, remember, this is a story about this young man who was possessed with demons, right? And he used to throw himself in the fire and cut up himself and do a bunch of foolishness, right? So, Jesus now is about to address this situation. So, watch this. So, in Mark 5, verse 8, and remember, we're going to read from verse 8 to verse 13. For he said unto him, Jesus said unto the possessed young man, Come, he's saying to the, the demon and the young man, Come out of the man, thou unclean, what? Spirit. So we will all agree so far that Jesus, while pointing at the human being, is not talking to the human being, but the spirit which is addressed as an unclean spirit in this human being. Again, I don't care if you believe me. Go read the scriptures, right? So, verse 9 of Mark 5. And he asked him, or Jesus asked the spirit, What is thy name? And he answered the spirit that is saying, My name is Legion, for we, for we are many. I, Legion, am the chief, but there are more in here with me who is subject to me legion watch this verse 10 
And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. So the, 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 the legion guy now is negotiating, all right, on the behalf of himself and the other demons. And he's saying, Jesus, don't, don't send us, don't send us. I mean, we, 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 if you're going to send us out, don't send us outside of the country. Now, there's a specific reason for that. And the reason is where you, uh, and this is another, another topic. This is advanced spiritual warfare. Where you're dealing with territorial spirits. Territorial spirits meaning that whatever voodoo concoction or nonsense that they did, it is only reserved for that particular state, community, country they did it in. Once the person it's, leaves that place, they wouldn't have those effects, those spiritual strange effects that they were having once they reside. So if they, let's say it was happening here in the Bahamas, here in Grand Bahama where I live, they'll be tormented by these spirits because the covenant contract is, is restricted to that particular jurisdiction spiritually. Once they go outside of that, it's no different from what I told you about the house. The curse item is in the house, right? That's what it was brought. So all evil activities is reserved for the house only. Once the person leaves the house, they can move on with their life. The spirits cannot go and harass them. All right? So watch this now. So verse 10 says, And he besought him, the demons besought him, much that, they would not, that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh, or there was close unto the mountains, a great herd of swines feeding. Now, what are swines? Pigs. Okay? Watch this now. Verse 12. And all the devils, who are the devils? The unclean spirits Jesus mentioned earlier. All the devils besought him or tried to reason with him saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Verse 13. And forthwith, Jesus agreed, Jesus gave them leave. Uh-huh. And the unclean spirits went out and entered, where did they enter? Into the who? The swines. I just proved my point. Can monitoring or any type of spirits be deployed into an animal for the animal to monitor you? Well, you just read it. Now it making sense why did this big crane, this bird, Every night, this bird finds its way on my property or the property across from me, but it's staring in my, my direction. Could it be there's a spirit in there that was deployed there to retrieve information? Who comes to my house? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's a book that I told you about uh, years, one of the first books that I started reading when I was dealing with my, when I accepted Jesus Christ in 1996. This book, uh, he came to set the captives free by uh, Rebecca Brown. And in this book, because you know she's narrating the story about her and Elaine. Elaine was the woman who was a, a, a witch and they were trying to kill her. And she talked, no, I think this is her second book called Prepare for War. It's the second book. And she talked about how in, in the satanic camps they would spray graffiti on a particular wall and people would believe that that's just kids being. Uh, you know, naughty and, and, and defacing the place. So she said, that's not what that is. She said, the graffiti in this case are literally satanic symbols where spirits are assigned to that place. And normally they will be across from the person that they're monitoring, the person home or business or what have you. And those spirits will now convey all activity of what is going on with that home or what have you. And I thought that was so interesting. So you see, like I said, these five that I'm giving you, these are not limited to how these forces can be deployed. All right? So watch this. So he says in verse 13, And fought where Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and they heard, and the herd ran violently down a steep place in the sea. They were about 2,000. Excuse me. And were choked in the sea. So listen. There were only 2,000 pigs there. So this dude had a minimum of 2,000 evil spirits in him. Isn't that interesting? Is that not interesting? But we saw where spirits can be transferred into animals. Very clear. Alright? Now. 
The third way, and again, these are not limited to, these are just the five most common ways these monitoring spirits are deployed. The third way is through our dreams, right? Through our dreams. I did a teaching on this before where you would have dreams and in this dream, you would always see this particular person, a shadowy figure or even a human or even an animal. More than likely it would be probably a cat or a dog, more, more likely a cat. And they're always staring at you in the dream, not doing anything, motionless and staring at you. Some of you will be able to relate to this. At nighttime, you, you, you go to bed, you turn off your light in your room, but it isn't that dark. You still can see certain images in terms of your, your bureau, your TV, and so on. But all of a sudden, you see an image that appear to be, look like a person. And you, you know, squint in your eye, and you're rubbing your eye, and you're trying to figure it out. And it look as if it is, uh, in an incremental way, coming towards you. And of course, you pitch up turn on the light, and it's not there. These are monitoring spirits. Or you will have where you at home, daytime, watching TV or doing something, and you keep having, like you see something through your peripheral view, or the corner of your eyes, like something quickly move by. And you know you're not losing your mind because this would happen constantly where you've been seeing these things. All of these are monitoring spirits. Or you've had instances where you at home or you just woke up or whatever, and you hear someone call your name, Kevin. And normally this would happen at night. Well, depending on how severe this case is, it will happen throughout uh, this person day or night. Now, how do we know, how do we know that this particular monitoring spirit is in, isn't for the entire family? Because only you could hear it. Nobody else hears these voices. If you're not home, thus this thing that's bird that normally come on your property will never come there. So it's specific. now, if you whether you're there or not, it comes. Then it's monitoring the entire family. But if it's only you, then it'll only be reserved to you. The, the strange happenings. So when you see these things, all of this uh, this is evidence. There's someone that's monitoring you. Some of you, uh, another sign of it. I've, I've told you my experiences with these things. You will literally feel this evil presence in your home. Literally. You could just be watching or even normally like when you see something through your peripheral and even though you try to shove that off, what normally accompanies you once you have that peripheral view thing? Your hair begin to rise on your arms or you feel uh, that fear. So that's the spirit of fear now, which is even more evidence because I tell you these spirits play dual roles. They're observing, they're monitoring. You feel a little vibration of your bed or your bed shaking. You hear certain sounds. You hear, like, especially nighttime. When nighttime fall, you hear like cracks in the roof or, or something moving or crawling in the roof and you're quick to dismiss it or blame it on probably a lizard or some kind of little insect because you don't want to think beyond that just to maintain your sanity. But all of these things are monitoring spirits has been deployed at you, right? So dreams. So we're going to look now, we're going to look at a principle how spirits can come in a dream. And it, th this is just the principle, meaning that the two examples I'm going to give you, you're going to see where God and angels entered the dream of a person. But it's not just limited to God and angels. These are just warfare principles to show you Demons can do this also. Evil spirits can come in your dreams also. All right? And they will come in your dream, and the whole purpose is to make a covenant with you. But if they're monitoring you, for the most part, for the most part in the dream, they will be staring at you. They'll be watching you from a distance or watching you up close. Okay? So, let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, and let's look at verse 5. Listen to what it says. It says, in Gibeon, uh -huh, the Lord appeared, okay, to King Solomon. How, go, how did he appear to him? He appeared to him in a dream. Hold on, let me see if I get this straight now. God is a what? Spirit. Let's be clear with that. He's not physical. He's a spirit. 
And we know that's the, 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 the verse. And they that worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. So we already clear that part of it. God is a spirit. But the Bible is telling us that God appeared to Solomon in a dream. Now, immediately, when you hear the word, the name Solomon, you go back to the flesh again, and you're thinking, he appeared to physical Solomon. No, 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 no. If he appeared to him in a dream, then the only time you can dream is if you're asleep. So that means Solomon is asleep. And this is only going to confirm what I've been teaching when it comes to spiritual warfare and dreams. The dream realm is literally the spiritual realm. So the spirit of Solomon was engaging with the spirit of the living God, but not in the physical realm, in the dream realm, which is the spiritual world. So we see here evidence where spirits such as God and any other spirit can invade a dream. Let's look at another one. Let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 11 to verse 13. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11 to verse 13. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary. Who was this day? This was the wise men who came to see Jesus. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child, which was Jesus, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and so on and so forth. Listen to verse 12. And being warned of God, well, how were they warned? In the flesh? No. Did God come up to them physically? No. No. Being warned of God in a what? In a dream. God is a what again? A spirit. Being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed Departed. Behold, the angel. Angel is an angel, a physical entity, or is it a spiritual entity? This has nothing to do with their physical being. This is all spiritual. So again, this is just evidence of how spiritual beings can engage us, even in our dreams, which is the reality of life, the spiritual world. All right. The fourth way in which these spirits are deployed is when the spirit itself someone send the spirit they ain't using no animal they ain't using no object they ain't using no dream they send a specific spirit at you all right that's the fourth one so let's look at first kings let's look at first kings because i'm giving you these because i'm about to dive into it right after this this, these are five ones. These five are uh, way that they are deployed. So let's go to 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings 22, and we're going to read from verse 19 to 22. And what we are looking to, to discover, to ascertain, how a spirit can be sent, all right? A spirit can be sent to monitor, to whatever. Watch this. So 1 Kings 22 verse 19. And he said, who was he? This is the prophet Micaiah, who was summoned by King Ahab, and he wanted to get a word from the Lord if himself and the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, should go and wage war with the inhabitants of uh, Ramoth Gilead. All right? So the Bible says now, Micaiah had this vision. All right, vision is the, the only difference between a vision and a dream is that in a dream you are asleep and a vision you are wide awake, but you now begin to see spiritually with your eyes the spiritual realm. So verse 19 of 1 Kings 22, it says, And he said, which is Micaiah, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord, this is a vision, sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab? We can stop right there. Where is this 
this this is a vision and where is the environment this is happening in in the heavens in in the throne room of god sorry god is sitting on his throne and he's looking down at the heavens heavens would mean the first second and third heavens and the only entities in the first second and third heavens are the spiritual beings angels demons so on and so forth so the bible says god is on his throne and to his left and to his right is the host of heaven and now he's going to ask these spiritual beings who will go and convince or persuade Ahab to go and fight in Ramoth Gilead. Remember, these are not human beings God is speaking to. So back to verse 20 of 1 Kings 22. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Who is going to persuade him to go up there and get killed then? Layman's terms. Watch this. And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. So what does that mean? One spirit said, will you go? The other spirit says, no, I ain't going. Will you go? No, I'm not going. Not me. But these are all spirits. All right? Again, what is the point of this story? We're showing how spirits could be deployed directly without having to put them into animals and so on. So verse 21 of 1 Kings 22 said, And there came forth a spirit. Oh, now we're talking. There came forth a spirit. A spirit is now about to volunteer its services. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. I will, this spirit says, I will persuade Ahab. I will convince Ahab. I will, uh, uh, Allow him to, to, to go to Ramoth Gilead where he's going to meet his death. So watch this. God is going to say here now in verse 22. And the Lord said unto him, how will you do it? So God is speaking to the spirit. Hey, look here, Mr. Spirit. How? Tell me your plan. Before I give you the, the green light, tell me, Mr. Spirit, how are you going to persuade? Because this is what spirits do. They persuade, they convince. All right? How are you going to do it? The Bible says, and he said, who is this he? The spirit. He said, I will go forth and I will be, listen, a lying spirit or a deceiving spirit. How? Let's, 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 let's back up. God is talking to his spirit because the spirit is about to be deployed. Okay? into the lives of some folks, right? But the spirit is being deployed directly. It's not being sent into a, 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 a figurine. It's not being sent into an animal, none of that. So watch what he says. He says, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit. Listen, listen, in the mouth of all the prophets. So this is interesting because there were 400 prophets of Baal. These were the prophets that Ahab went to seeking the future events, but they were not of God. Ahab and his wife Jezebel, they served Baal, the God of Baal. That's who they served, okay? So the Bible is saying that the prophecies that the 400 prophets originally gave Ahab, because every one of them were on one accord, they said that you're going to go into Aram and Gilead and you're going to win the battle. And Micaiah was the only one who was telling them, but that ain't going to happen. So the Bible is now taking us behind the scenes, spiritually, where this all originated. I go in somewhere with this. A lot of y'all who love prophecy, who love these fake lion prophets and prophetess talking mess, watch what the Bible says. The Bible says that this one spirit said to God, the way that I'm going to convince Ahab, I'm not going to him directly, because he may think I'm just a thought. What I will do is I will go and possess my, my, these, my counterparts, because they were all of demonic origin. These, these prophets were into witchcraft. He says, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the 400 prophets. So every last one of those prophets were influenced, were persuaded to tell Ahab. They didn't even realize that they were lying. They probably thought they, they, well, they were hearing from spirits, but they were not spirits of God. So the 400 prophets telling me, Kevin, you can be rich. Why wouldn't I believe it? Why? 
Tell me why. And we always just go with the majority. Tell me why. I ain't gonna believe him. So when Micaiah say, look here, homeboy, I know what these dudes telling you, but that ain't gonna happen. Long story short, it did happen. He lost his life, Ahab, in Ramoth Gilead. But I want you to see, when you before these people who are liars, you didn't ask God, Father, amplify my discerning spirit. You didn't say, Lord, you didn't follow the rules, test the spirit to see if it is of God or not. No, you so desperate that because they were in this white, long Batman suit and this long cone on their head, you see that as God material. And whatever garbage they tell you, you run with it, not knowing there's a lying spirit speaking to that liar. And now I'm going to know it's a liar because that filthy, patho pathological, habitual, chronic liar is going to charge you for the lie they just told you. And then they're going to put it, God said, so it. But we ain't going to go to the day. I got too much to cover. Deal with that another day. Verse 22 of uh, 1 Kings 22 says, And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith or how will you persuade him? And he, which is the evil spirit, the lying spirit in particular, he says, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets. And he said, meaning God, God said, Thou shalt, thou shalt persuade him. And prevail also, meaning that I, the sovereign God, have not only, excuse you, excuse me, give you the permission to go, but I have anointed you to be successful in your efforts. So he says, you should go and prevail. So you see there? The spirit was deployed. No middleman, no animals, no nothing. They sent the monitoring spirit on you. That's the evil presence you feel in your home. When nightfall and all those strange things happening to you, that's the, the spirit that they sent. They send that there. The last one, now this here is the most important one to me, because this one here, this, is, this one is hard to identify if you lack spiritual rules of engagement, all right? So the last one in terms of these monitoring spirits being deployed is that it is usually deployed through a human being. Yeah. Through a human being. So this person who went to foolishness, right, deployed an evil spirit on a human being who is friends with you. And they came to your house and they discussing stuff. But your enemy is going to be updated with everything that has happened there because there's a spirit on your friend that's retrieving information to take back to the camp. I'm trying to help you. We can prove this right now. I so love scripture. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. You see this all the time, again, with these false prophets and false teachers of the words and so on. These people, I'm telling you, if you don't know the Bible, if you don't know the rules, you will fall and for these people and they will keep you in a cage of bondage for the rest of your life. If you don't open your spiritual eyes, open up God word and read it for yourself and ask God to give you clarity, all your life you'll be giving your hard earned money and resources to the agents of Satan. Watch this, I can prove it to you. So let's go here now to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians and chapter 11. And we're going to read from verse 13 to verse 15, okay? Again, everything I've said to, said to you thus far, and what I will continue to tell you, these are spiritual laws. These are spiritual rules. This is how the spiritual realm operate. If you lack such knowledge, then you have just volunteered to be a candidate for failure, for destruction, and by default, curses are levied on your life to limit your life. If you want to break free, then you take what the Bible tells you, the rules, not what I say, and you now begin to be a doer of these rules. How to prevent these things from happening to you. If they have happened to you already, already now let's seek the cure via the rules. 
And this is why you got to be careful who you're listening to. And when I say careful, I don't mean walk around being cautious. I said, what I mean is, what does the Bible say? Because whatever this joker is saying, I am comparing it with scripture. I'll give you a perfect example. Last night, uh, I was on YouTube uh, doing some work, right? With my channel. Anyway, this channel came in my lineup, this lady who claimed to be a dream interpreter and stuff like that. So I said, let me listen to her to see what she have to say. And she was talking about, uh, 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 I can't remember. Anyway, whatever she was talking about, she was talking about dreams. That's right. She was talking about dreams. And she was saying, if you, if you have, I don't know what type of dream it was, but whatever it was, listen to what this woman said. She said, go get a glass of water. Now, mind you, she using Jesus, the power of God, and praying, all of that shit, all of what you would sum up to be, just got to be a woman of God. So she said, if you have this particular dream over and over, this is how you stop it. She said, you get a, go and wherever, get a glass of water, and you read Psalms 91 or whatever Psalms over it seven times. And after you read it seven times, you must, there's something you're supposed to do first and then you drink the water. I, I say, now hold on, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. So what I did is I went and watched a few of her other videos. What did Kevin L.A. Ewing discover? Because Kevin understands spiritual rules. I find a person, she didn't say this, but based on her behavior, I, could, I know it, I know these things. I find a person who clearly comes from a background or a foundation of ancestral worship and has now mixed that up with her Christianity and now presenting it to the people. So what she's doing, she's using the Bible because, and that's another thing, every scripture she gives is a psalm. And anybody who knows about these things when it comes to sorcery, it is the psalms that they use, just like the book, the six and seven book of, of Moses or whatever, the witchcraft book. All of the spells incorporated in those spells are scriptures from the Psalms. So right away I know this is a, 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 a witch. This is a warlock, a sangoma. So anyone who follow her message and don't know what I'm telling them right now, have zero knowledge that they're engaging in a ritual that will put restrictions on their life, that will put curses on their life, that will put limitations on their life, that will assign evil spirits. The woman didn't come there and do it to you. She came there under the guise of a woman of God, calling on Jesus, calling on the Holy Spirit, all this stuff, and now telling you to follow these rituals that the Bible does not prescribe, which comes from the seed and the bowels of Satanism and sorcery. But if you don't know better, not only will you give her uh, your kingdom, you can sow in her ministry, her demonic ministry. So this is why you need to know. You need to know. You need to know. Okay? Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 13, we're going to see now where you're going to now be careful of the people you got around you. Be careful of people you got coming up in your house. And I, I'm a strong... Listen, I, I listen, I don't believe and know each and anybody coming up in my place. Now that there, now that's one thing nobody gotta worry about. All right. A lot of people don't even know where I live because I have seen people, even friends of mine, who saw the need to have people coming in and out. And I told them, I said, listen, I can tell you now, I, I am on I, I all these people you got coming up and down in your place, I can tell you, not everybody who say they is friend is your friend. And people will be looking at you and monitoring you, being used by the devil. And that spirit of jealousy rise upon them. And they got access to your place and put curse items in your place. And you lose everything. Oh, no, 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 no. You won't come in here. No, 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 no. Whatever you got to say to me, put it in the email. Send it on, the, send it on WhatsApp. You don't got to see me. We could do a Zoom. You ain't coming here. Don't bring me no food because I can eat it. I can throw. I can tell you now. I can throw it away. Don't bring me no food, especially no soup. I don't want none of your food. Keep your witchcraft voodoo food because Kevin ain't eat it. I can tell you that now. Now, if you offended, you will get over that. But I tell you who ain't eat it. Don't pack nothing for me. Don't don't. I remember one time I was uh, ministered to one place 
and they, they pack up all my food. Now, ain't nobody, I ain't seen them take up no food for nobody else. Oh, uh, Minister Kevin, we got this here for you. This your main course. This your dessert. This your so-and-so. I say, yeah. I say, okay, put it all in one. Make sure you're tied up because I, I don't want to carry different stuff on my hand. Listen, when I leave from that place, when I leave from that place, <laughs> it's so funny. I swing that thing with all my might out my window and toss it in the bush where it belong. Now, the, the, the only poison they fixed that day was them raccoon and snake and stuff in the bush. Now, they probably have an epileptic seizures in there, but not Kevin, because I told them, I don't eat from the body. Now, see that you won't get to me, I can be rude. I can take it, but I'm tossing it in the garbage. Now, I'm telling you that now, people listening to me all over the world, don't off me. If we eating from a restaurant, I don't want to eat your food. And if you pick the restaurant, I, I, I can pass on that. I can go to my own restaurant and eat. I don't listen to me. I know you're all saying, Kevin, no, you got to take it easy. No, you need to take it easy. Plenty of people six feet under the ground right now. Why? Because they trusted people who didn't like them. No, I ain't eating your food. Keep, keep your Sangoma design. Huh? Keep your voodoo porridge to yourself because I ain't eat it. I don't tell my children, if I catch you eating from someone, I'll beat you silly. <laughs> I remember growing up, my grandmother would have murdered one of us. When she used to see us going to me, she said, I don't feed you. I don't care who offer you what. If I, if you come back here and I learn you eat from these people, you can wish they did fix you. <laughs> so no, I don't buy into that. All right? Now, let's get back to this because I don't see this going into a part two because it's just too much information. There is a terminology used in military warfare. And it's called reconnaissance mission, right? I'm going to tell you what the meaning of that is, because it has to do with everything that we're talking about. In every army, every war, there is a branch called the intelligence branch. And the intelligence branch, they don't fight, they don't shoot no guns, they don't do none of that. Their sole job is to retrieve information from the opposing forces or their enemies. Once they get this information, they now have their meetings to strategize. We just sent a drone over uh, the Bahamas and we see where they keep their aircrafts. We see where their ground vehicles are, but we also see where their fueling stations are. So when we launch this war on them, it's going to be a guerrilla war, meaning that they ain't even know we're coming. The first thing we're going to do, so they don't have an advantage in the sky, we're going to shoot down their plane and destroy their fueling system. So we're limiting them. So this is how this reconnaissance thing works. This is the same thing I'm telling you right now. So the enemy is observing you. I see Kevin love his wife. I see he love his children. I can't get him. So let me come after what he love. Because they've been watching for a while now. So they know exactly what they're coming after. Only you don't know. Because you so caught up in trying to, 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 to be a part of this prosperity gospel and be rich. That you, 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 just, you, just, you have no knowledge of the plots, plans, and schemes spiritually being implemented for your life to ensure that you never fulfill the will of God, that you never enjoy your life, that you constantly connect with the wrong people that will always give a negative result because all of this is being orchestrated by evil powers, but it originally started out by them monitoring you. So the word or the phrase reconnaissance mission, reconnaissance is a mission to obtain information by visual observation or other detection methods about the activities and resources of an enemy and to develop strategies for future attack. In layman's terms, it's that I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch this enemy. I'm never going to attack them. Not right now. I'm going to watch, if it takes me a whole, I'm going to watch what they eat, what they drink, what they love, what they hate, what time they go to the bathroom. I'm listening to the things they're complaining about, the negativity, all of this we're recording. So when my group, 
who are working in harmony against this person sit down and we bring our heads together how we can deal with this person we ain't just arbitrarily putting pulling that note no hat okay now come group put up on the display board there this is what kevin like this is what he love this is a secret sin going over here nobody knows about this so we can target this let's try to expose him here and blah 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 you have no knowledge of this and all of this is being concocted against you right so you see here this is clear so now let's look at some people in the bible who we know of their names are very known but there were spirits attached to them based on one of these five uh, deploying mechanism so let's go to acts let's go to the book of acts let's go to the book of acts and we're going to read verse chapter 19 and we're going to read from verse 13 to verse 16. acts chapter 19 verse 13 to verse 16. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, <laughs> I like that, certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. So these vagabond Jews were Jews who clearly wasn't into uh, the Jesus that Paul uh, was dealing with. They figure, well, hey, look, if Paul could do these miracles, we might as well just cash in on this also, right? But they have no idea that what they are coming up against are highly intelligent, disembodied beings, meaning spirits, who are fully aware of what they're dealing with. And usually these spirits, when they come after you, they are people, the people who are coming out uh, gifted people, anointed people. Now the people will never think that because they're probably still drinking and, and, and having sex with people and still living a sinful life. But you see, you, see you, you didn't become anointed the day you got saved. You didn't become anointed the day the pastor said, I anoint you. You were anointed before the foundation of the world. Whatever happened after that in terms of the ceremonies and so on, that was just the earthly part of it. But you were always called to be a doctor, called to be a preacher, called you, that was already on you. It reminds me of uh, the story about when God told uh, Elijah. He says, listen, before you die, I want you to anoint Haziel, the king of, sorry, Haziel, who will be the next king of Syria. I want you to anoint Jehu, who's going to be able, who's going to be responsible for destroying the house of Jezebel. And I want you to anoint Elijah in your stead, meaning that he will replace you. He never did none of it. He never did any of it. He went up to heaven but never fulfilled what God asked him to do. His uh, successor, Elijah, right? Now, uh, he was on his way, Elijah was on his way to, to, to Syria, uh, Damascus, the capital of Syria. And it was told that King ben who was the king of Syria at that time, he was sick, and he learned that Elijah was coming there. So he says, listen, Haziel, who was the captain of the army, he says, listen, Go and take the best that Syria have and take it to Elijah and get a word from the Lord to see if I will recover from the sickness. So the Bible says he took 40 camels with the best that Syria had to offer and he bucked into to, to Hazel. Now remember, Elijah, who's already gone on, he never died. He was taken up into the heavens by the chariots. He was commissioned by God to anoint this man. He never did it. Elijah now, who is now replacing Elijah, he ain't do it. But it didn't matter who did or did not do it. God had already ordained this man to be anointed to be the next king, even though he's a wicked man. So watch this. When Hazel came to him, right? Hazel said, my master sent me. Yeah, you could have these 40 camels and all this stuff on it. He need to know whether or not he's going to live or die. So the Bible says that Elijah looked at him and twists his head. He says... I, I see in the spirit where he will live, but I also see where he will die. And Elijah was confused. So Elijah held his hair down, and I think the Bible said he began to cry. So Hazel said, what you crying for? He said, because I see you becoming the next king of Syria, and you will slaughter 
the women and children and men of Israel. Hazael saying, who do you think I am? You think I'm a dog? You think I'll do something like that? But what I love about the story, even though Elijah and Elijah did not anoint the man, your physical anointing somebody doesn't make them who God called them to be. They were always that. It, it's just an earthly exercise, I guess, to make everybody else aware that, hey, look, this guy is really anointed. But he went back to Syria. The king asked him, listen, so what did he say? He said, you can live. Yeah, you can live. That night, when King Benadad fell asleep, the Bible says that Haziel took a piece of cloth and wet it and put it over the face of King Benadad and killed him. And he became the next king of Syria. I did a teaching on it, and, and I think out of all of the Bible stories, that one right there, it always make me, it confirms to me, man don't make you anointed. Man don't determine your destiny. God did that already. And this I knew a long time ago because this was a part of my exodus from the four walls. That there don't make you whom you are called to be. These are only uh, stopping points to chisel you to what you are supposed to become. So if you feel that unless reverend, bishop, apostle so and so touch you or take you through the protocols of whatever, if you feel that if you don't go through that, you cannot go and minister the word of God, you are delusional just like them. Just like them. Jehu was never anointed by Elijah. But he still took down the house of Jezebel. You can't stop a person who's anointed by God already. But anyway, I won't get too much into that because I'm too juicy. So watch this now. In Acts 19, it says, verse 13 says, There, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure or command you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. Okay. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, a chief of the priests, which did so. Listen, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, because I monitor him too. I know him, watch this. And Paul I know, I monitor them too. And the reason why they monitor you is because you're called, you're anointed. They know if you follow your giftings, you can raise hell in the kingdom of darkness. But y'all jokers, I already own y'all. So watch what the Bible says in verse 15. He says, an evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Verse 16, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. This is one spirit doing this now. And prevail against them or beat them so bad so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. One spirit. He said, I've been monitoring this whole group. I know y'all. Y'all ain't real. Jesus real. I know him. Paul real. I know him. But y'all here? Y'all can get the beating of your life right now. You see why I tell you? You got to want, you got to pray, God, please give me the spiritual understanding so I will know how to fight. And not only fight, that by knowing more of the spiritual rules, by default, it heightened my sense of discernment. I could discern better and accurately now because I'm not doing it arbitrarily, but I'm doing it based on the rules. I'm looking at what the rules say, and I could see where a spirit will be limited to me based on the rules. As bad as this spirit is, as wicked as it is, because I know not only my authority, but more importantly, the authority that the rules give me. I can talk more sensibly when you're talking about the things of God. I, can, I, I, will, I will be more successful in the things of God because I am not operating by what bishop, pastor, whoever say. I am operating by what the rules say. I love rules. I love it. That's why they have a problem with me, because I am a fanatic for the rules. That's why I'm successful in what I do, because I am basing what I do on the rules. End the story. End the story. Let's look at another one. Let's go to Acts 16. 
Acts chapter 16, we're going to read from verse 16 to verse 18. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 to verse 18. Listen to what it says. Dealing with monitoring spirits now. And it came to pass, as we went to pray, a certain damsel possessed, meaning that it lives in her, possessed with a spirit uh -huh, of divination. What does that mean? She's able to communicate in the spiritual realm. But from a demonic uh, advantage. She's illegally doing it. Demons are helping her. So the best way I can explain it. She has a spirit of divination. So this spirit on her communicates with every monitoring spirit on everyone else. She's about to read their horoscope, read their future, whatever. So you say, hey, you, you, you there. Uh, yeah. Kevin, yeah, first time I ever met her. So she said to me, you, you, you preach. And I see a lot of people attracted to what you're saying and got some haters, but that's all right. And she's telling you stuff and, and to you, if you don't know no better, if you don't know no better, you say this got to be God because she is so accurate. But here's what you're missing. What is she really accurate about? She's accurate about the cipher stuff. That's what she's accurate about. There's nothing deep about what she's saying, because everything she's saying is, and I say surface because these are the things that the monitoring spirits observe. So the familiar spirit on this person, Kevin, in this case, true divination is communicating with the familiar spirit attached to her. And now it's telling her, I see blah, blah, blah. But again, if you don't know no better, you think this is of God. You would be totally convinced. That this is of God. So watch this just to prove my point. It, verse, it says here, and it came to pass, verse 16 of Matthew, of Acts 16. And it came to pass as we went to pray, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by so saying. So you see there? You see why I keep telling you? Anybody who prophesied to you and then charge you money, they're a soothsayer. Because they use this one as a cash cow with this demon in her to speak prophesy stuff where through divination it was familiar spirits on both parties communicating with each other and revealing it to this woman so it said it brought brought her masters much gain by her suit saying which is also her predictions verse 17 of act 16 the same meaning the same woman followed paul this is powerful why is this powerful doing because the spirit of divination, because they have dual role, is also a monitoring spirit. And what does monitoring spirits do? They follow. They, they, they record. They watch you. They observe you. But I love what Paul can do. So verse 17 says, The same followed Paul and us and cried saying, because she's now going to reveal, monitoring spirit, the things that she know. The demon speaking through her. Cried saying, These men, she's very accurate, are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So you see how deceptively they could just muzzle their way into, as if I'm a part of you, Paul, as if I'm a part of you, the people of God, because you see here, I'm telling you all, they came to preach Jesus Christ. But who's saying this? One who's possessed with a spirit of divination and a monitoring spirit. So it wasn't like she wasn't correct. She was very much correct. But it's that conniving evil spirit in her. So watch this, verse 18. And this did she many days. Because that's what a monitoring spirit does. It's on your case 24-7 to observe, to see what you're dealing with. Recording everything you do. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, oh, I love it, turned and said to who? To who? The spirit, not the woman. Paul said to the who? The spirit. Paul recognized, you know why? Because he know the laws, the rules, the principles. Paul wasn't listening to her mess, but he's a man of God. He already know that. Anybody could figure that out. Anybody could tell her that. No. Paul designed that there is a spirit operating in this clown. So the Bible says, and this did Paul, this, and this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that same hour. You all listen to this? 
you all listen to this now this caused Paul a lot of problems because they went and complained that Paul caused them their livelihood so for them to even side with them that mean they they accepted the fact that this was normal okay we can sorcery and witchcraft and foolishness all day but what I'm showing you here is how Paul identified the spirit and dealt with the spirit not the woman because Paul discerned spiritually that it is not this girl it is what is upon her or what is in her that's causing this uh, to happen all right let's go back here to second second uh, Corinthians 11 let's go to second Corinthians 11 second Corinthians 11 and we're going to read from verse 13 to 15 again okay I'm pointing some other stuff here so it says for such are false for such are false apostles, watch this, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. So the scriptures just made it extremely clear to us. Are there false prophets and apostles and reverends and pastors and teachers? Yes, they are. But the real thing here is, is that while they are not just false, but there are spirits operating in them. See, they're, just, they're not just liars saying, oh, I'm a pastor. But the truth is, they're, 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 they've been ordained by their church, but they're devils. But there's a devil in them, just like the woman, the damsel. So he says, for such are false. False meaning they're not true. False apostles, deceitful workers, transforming. The word transforming meaning changing themselves into the apostles of Christ. Verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 11. And no marvel or, or, or don't be shocked or astonished. Listen. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So this is powerful here. Because Satan is also a spirit. And he's saying Satan, just like his ministers as we're about to read, meaning those who serve him, the fake pastors, apostles, and so on, he says they also have the ability to do this transformation. So he says in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 11, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Okay? Verse 15, Therefore, it is no great thing, it is not impossible, it is no great thing if his ministers or his servants, those who serve him, his minister also, what, be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their work. So the Bible is telling us, you can have a person on a pulpit claiming to be a pastor, running a church, an apostle or whatever, all right? And according to the Bible, it says that that person could be a false pastor, a false apostle, a false prophet, or whoever. It is quite possible. But the reality is, there is a devil living in them, giving them the ability to transform or to become like a real pastor. Monitoring spirits. I mimic them all day, watch all their videos. I hope you're all getting this, man. I hope you're all getting this. This stuff real. Because what it's going to do now, if you adhere to these teachings and this knowledge, it's now going to make you more aware and not gullible and susceptible to anybody who say they're a child of God. Anyone who's going to tell you uh, they heal the sick and whatever they prophesy come to pass, and the minute you start hearing that, take off running from right there. All right? A true man and woman of God, their works speak for them. They don't have to say nothing about what they did. Their work and their fruit, people will speak about them. The acts and the works that they did will speak about them. There's a song by uh, the Consuelos. Uh, I used to like this. My auntie used to play this a lot. May the work I've done speak for me. And it's the truth. It is the truth. So the Bible shows you now. I brought you to this, this, this particular chapter here because... This is now where the masquerading spirits come in, operating in a person. Masquerading. So they could masquerade as something that they're not. Because it says that Satan has that ability, so does those who, who serve him or those who minister uh, uh, to him. 
All right? Now, I'm going to show you now, I'm going to get to a point here, and a lot of people ask me about this, and the ability to astral project. To astral project means to have your spirit or soul or whatever leave your body. And you could project that to some place and literally see what the people are doing. And even here, ain't no demon doing this. The demon is assisting you, but your spirit is actually being projected to a certain place, a country, whatever, however you all do it. Now, there's an episode in the Bible, there's a story in the Bible actually, where this happened. But this happened with a man of God. There wasn't no demon doing this. This was a man. And the reason I'm showing you the, sh the story is I'm showing you a principle here. Okay? Because I need you to be aware that these things are possible. This ain't no hocus pocus. I've given you scripture after scripture and proven my point. Okay? So let's go to uh, 2 Kings 5. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 5. All right? 2 Kings 5. And we're going to read from verse 25 to verse 27. And I'm just going to give you a, a backdrop on this. This is a story about Elijah, E-L-I-S-H-A, and his servant, Gehazi. All right? Now, there was a guy, I think, from Syria. His name was Naaman. He was the captain of Syria. I could be mistaken in terms of which country it is, but I believe it's Syria. He was the captain of Syria army, but he had leprosy. But there was a, a maid who advised his wife that if he want to be healed, he must go over to Israel to this guy named Elijah who could hook him up. So he decides to go there, and when he went there, he knocked on Elijah's door, but Elijah didn't answer the door. Elijah sent his servant, Gehazi, and Gehazi says, listen, go down by the Jordan River, dip seven times, and get from around this door, yeah? So, Naaman was highly offended because he figured him being a man of great stature and, and position that Elijah, who also was supposed to be a great prophet, should have come and see him face to face. So he, he left angry with no intentions of going to dip in this uh, Jordan River. His servant convinced him. He said, listen, Naaman, I know you upset and I know it was very disrespectful, but I promise you, this guy for real, please go and dip. So he went. He went and he dipped the seven times. And on the seven, when he's coming back up, brown, he was clear and free of all leprosy. He now goes back to Elijah's residence, right? To now give Elijah uh, some form of payment for what he did. So Elijah said, I don't want no money from you and I don't want nothing from you. Gehazi was sitting there observing all of this. So after uh, Naaman left, uh, Gehazi, seemingly unbeknowing to Elijah, sneak out and went behind Naaman. Now physically, Elijah would have no knowledge of this because he snuck out and do it, right? So he stopped and he said, no, 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 can't be carrying all this Gucci outfit and all these rope chains and stuff. No, no, no. He said, don't mind Elijah. Elijah old-fashioned, he old school, but I'll have a few of those nice double breast suits over there and some Jerry Curl kit stuff over there and some weave there for the wife, you know, give me the 18 inch and give me the, 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 the other, other size you have. So he gave him all the stuff. So on the way back, Gehazi hid some of the stuff and he goes back into the house where Elijah was. So this is where the story is going to be picked up. In 2 Kings 5, verse 25 to verse 26. So listen to what it says. But he went in the house. Who's this? Gehazi, which is the servant of Elijah. And stood before his master, which would have been Elijah. And Elijah said unto him, Whence come thou? Or where did you come from, Gehazi? It's a question. Gehazi's going to lie now. He says, And he, which is Gehazi, said, Thy servant went nowhere. I didn't go nowhere. I was always here. Listen to what Elijah is going to say in verse 26. I so love 
I love scripture. Listen to this. And he, who is he? We need to know the characters because we need to know the full context. He would be Elijah. And he, which is Elijah, said unto him, which is Gehazi, went not mine heart with thee? Hold on, hold on, back up. Would you just say just now? Because he's telling him, my heart went with you. But we're going to define that word heart in its original Hebrew text because it can bring more understanding to the scripture. But before we define that, let's continue to read. He says in verse 26 of 2 Kings 5, And he which is Elijah said unto him which is Gehazi, Went not mine heart with thee, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments? and olive yards, and vineyards, and sheep, and oxen, and maidservants. So how did he know this man gave Gehazi that? You wasn't there. You were right there in the house. How did you know? Well, let's define the word heart. So I went, let me put this up here in my Hebrew thing. Look up the word heart, right? In the 26th verse of Second uh, Kings. And listen what it means. Right? The word heart here means the inner man, the spiritual, spiritual man. It also means a person's mind or their will. It's speaking now about the soul, because your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect. So Elijah is basically saying, I was able to be transported spiritually to where you all were, and I observed everything that you all did. So when you come with this nasty lie, Mr. Gehazi, but you ain't been nowhere, you're a liar, because now Elijah goes into detail as to what he saw. Listen to what he said, verse 26 again. Verse 26 says, oh, come on. Verse 26 says, And he which is Elijah said to Gehazi, Went not my heart with you? Or oh, you didn't know my spirit was with you. You didn't know I was following you. What I'm showing you here is a principle. Now this was godly done, but a lot of people do this in the occult. And they do it through what they call the, the three-chord thing. I ain't going to all that. We can discuss it another time. Where they can be astral projected out of their body and a demon take over their body pretending to be them as to whoever's in the environment of that body to make them believe that's the person while they are doing whatever they need to do. Elijah, on the other hand, a man of God, though he's, the scripture is showing us that while Elijah was in the house and Gehazi was way up the road uh, getting gifts from this man and so on, Elijah said, my heart, in Hebrew, which means that my spirit man was with you. I was watching everything that you did. And now Elijah went into detail and tell him how you take monies and garments and sheep and all this stuff from this guy. This was not the time to be doing that. That's the reason why he didn't do it. The question is, how did you know, Elijah? How did he know? I have sat with many people who s s told me how a certain person astral project in their room. Or, like I say, they could, have, they could have a friend or who they think is their friend. And whenever that friend comes over and that friend starting to, have, starting to have conversation, the friend is always talking about stuff that these people has already discussed in the house. But the friend don't know that this, pe this person astral projecting in the home and retrieving information. They have no knowledge of that. In fact, if you tell them that, they say, no, man, that those things are not true, man. Oh, uh -uh. Then, of course, they can tell you, you know, you're a child of God. you you covered by the blood of Jesus. And, and they say, see, because they, they say that because they don't know the rules. What rules do you mean? Well, the Bible says, another rule, uh, Ephesians 6 and uh, 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? Why should I do now and I'm saved already? Why should I do that and I have Jesus already? I don't have to put on no armor because Jesus got me covered. I am covered in the blood of Jesus. No weapon for me. Again. All that stuff you're saying. Yeah, but the rule said, put on the whole armor of God so that you, Christian, you anointed one, you, Christian, who covered by the blood of Jesus, will be able to, to stand against the wiles, the tricks, the schemes of the devil. So it's telling me, even though I know Jesus, if I do not have on the armor, then someone could astral project in my place. I love rules. 
I love rules. They got problem with me because I love the rules. And I don't give you mumbo jumbo. I giving you scripture after scripture, giving you the rules. Now you know how to fight. Now you know how to position yourself. Now you know when you're feeling this feeling of fear in your place, you know that the emotion of fear that you are feeling is an indicator that the spirit of fear is there coming to monitor and to harass you. Now that I know that, I start rebuking now because I understand these things. I'm talking to my head now. Spirit of fear, I command you to leave right now. I command you to leave my place. I cover my place with the blood of Jesus. I outfit myself with the whole arm of God. I engage in the rules now. I ain't just talking fool. I am engaging the rules that I've been learning. Now you can see fruit. Now you're going to see fruit. Because you ain't just throwing a rock on there and hoping you hit something. No. Because you know the rules. You operating by the rules. That's all I'm teaching you. I want nothing from you. I want what I want from you is following the rules. Follow the rules. That's all I'm asking you to do. Just follow the rules. Guess who else had a monitoring spirit? The Apostle Paul. He had some major, major, major battles with it. And let me prove it to you. Many, well, there are many proofs of it, but I'm going to give you this one. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, and we're going to read from verse 16 to verse 24. And it just goes to show you, like I said earlier, everybody have a monitoring spirit. Everyone. The devil has assigned spirits to all of these people, right, to record information, to watch everything that they do. Because when he come at you, he's coming after you. He's coming based on the information he have. And this is why the Bible says to us, my favorite scripture, Proverbs 11 verse 9b, through knowledge, what Kevin giving you right now, and whoever preacher preaching the truth. True knowledge shall youth or just be delivered. And what does the word deliver means to be saved. So it tells me if I don't have the information, I will not be saved or rescued from the attack that's coming at me invisibly that I don't know about. I have no idea that the enemy isn't coming at me physically. Whatever happened to me physically will only be the result of what already was conceived spiritually. So while I over here discussing uh, his name is in Jesus, is Yahusha, and you are the black Jews or the purple Jews or the, the orange Philistines, while you run on superficial garbage, there's stuff happening in the spiritual realm against you. And because of your lack of knowledge, you are committed to superficial stuff. You are committed. The Bible says, do not argue genealogy and foolish questions. Why? Because it, it, it's taking up time. It, it, it ain't going to change nothing. What you deal with in the spiritual realm is what's going to result of what's going to happen physically. See, that's what I want here. Don't come to me with no foolishness. Don't come to me with Jesus as orange and green. Don't come to me with garbage. None of that could stop the devil from putting me in the headlock. None of that could stop this monitoring spirits tying up my destiny. And when my seasons of blessings come, because I'm not spiritually equipped to know that this is my season, the season just going by all the time, all the time. All because I over here arguing with this one over here saying, uh, Jesus, this and, 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 and there's no Jesus because there was no letter J back in the time of Jesus. And like, like that's going to bring fruit to my life. Now, I know some of you are offended, but listen, the reality is, it's the truth. Do you truly believe when Christ come to judge you? Come here, Kevin. Come here, Mary. Mary, you call me Yeshua. Kevin, you call me Jesus. Kevin, go straight to hellfire for calling me Jesus. Don't you ever call me Jesus again. I see the souls you've won, and I've seen the work you've done. And in fact, you, you did far more. Mary didn't even do nothing here. But because she called me Yeshua and you called me Jesus, go straight under hell. Does that make any sense to you? So why are you arguing about it all the time? Why are you allowing people? Your Bible says to you, I believe in Titus, do not argue genealogy. That's what I read. But you wouldn't know that if you don't read your Bible. So Romans chapter 7. Beginning of verse 16. If then, this is Paul speaking. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin uh -huh, 
that dwelleth in me. Sin that dwelleth in me. For I know, verse 18 of Romans 7, for I know that in me, that is, excuse me, my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So this is what Paul is saying. Paul said, listen, I am a man anointed by God. And I am on fire to do the things of God. But for whatever reason I try to do the will of God, or even do what is right, there is this spirit of procrastination. There is this spirit of destruction. There is this spirit of delay. There is always something coming to challenge the good I want to do. Paul is about to reveal to us. Like I say, once you know the rule, you can identify what you're dealing with. It's a spirit that's monitoring you, Paul. It already knows the ins and out of you. It isn't going to send, let me give you an example, a monitoring spirit who would have already studied you, right? If you are a person who you are heterosexual, all right, you are fornicator, you love to have uh, intercourse with the opposite sex, there's no way in the world that that monitoring spirit who's been monitoring you and knows what you're dealing with sexually is going to send you a homosexual. You're not attracted to that. So this just goes to show you, you're not dealing with stupid, ignorant beings. You're dealing with highly intelligent, evil, deceiving powers. And they have studied you. So Paul, they know, he won't get back to the word of God. He wants more revelation from God. So what I'm going to do is send a spirit that's going to frustrate him. A spirit that's going to make him wretched. And that monitoring spirit is going to now report to the kingdom of darkness in terms of its success and the quality of work that they're doing with Mr. Paul here. But Paul now is going to say to us some rules and spiritual laws he has discovered as a result of what he's going through. So watch this. He says in verse 18, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present, meaning that I want to do the right thing, but how to perform the right thing, I can't seem to figure that out. Verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, I do. I, it's so easy for me to do what I'm not supposed to be doing, I'm supposed to do what I'm supposed to be doing. Verse 20, now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So Paul is telling us now that even though he is highly anointed by God, even though this guy is going to write two-thirds of the New Testament, he's saying there's still an evil power that not just challenging him, but that's being successful. But Paul is now going to give us a major nugget in breaking this case. So verse 21, he now explained. Remember what he said? He said, whenever he do sin, it's no longer him doing it, but sin that dwelleth in him. While he want to do things spiritually, his flesh man want to do something totally opposite. Verse 21 says of Romans 7, I find then a law, and this is what I love. See, when I hear law, when I hear rules and precepts, commands, and, 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 and so on, this isn't just something anyone could make up. This here is a standard. This is the way things operate. And if I'm in a position or want to be in a position to defeat this thing, then I need to know the rules that govern it. I need to know the laws that, that, that cause it to exist because that's what I'm coming after. If, if this is the source of it, giving it, of giving it life, then I'm going to operate from this source and try to strategize how I could shut this source down. So Paul says in verse 21, after going through this mental battle, the enemy is coming up against his mind. So verse 21 of Romans 7 says, I find then a law that when I would do good, uh-huh, what? What happened? Evil, the monitoring spirit, is what? Is present with me. He ain't going nowhere. He ain't going nowhere. The same spirit of procrastination also plays the role of a, mon of a monitoring spirit. The same spirit of delay also plays the role of, of, of uh, a monitoring spirit. The same spirit of, of uh, whatever else also plays the role of the monitoring spirit. He ain't going nowhere. I can watch you till the day you leave this earth, Mr. Paul. And I'm going to tell my buddies and myself and everybody else, this is what you like and don't like. I'm, I'm, I'm going to record. We have a whole file on you, Mr. Paul. So watch what he says. He says, I find that a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, remember, 
uh, Elijah. Elijah said, but my heart went with you. We went to look up the word heart in the Hebrew. It means my inward man, meaning my spiritual man. All right. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, my spirit man. Verse 23. But I see another law. I see another law in my members. I see another law, another rule, another principle in my members or in my body warring against warring against the law listen warring against the law of my hands no warring against the law of my private parts no warring against the law of my mind so where does these spirits and monitoring spirit focus on my mind giving me suggestions just like back in uh kings 22 with uh, Ahab and the, the false prophets who was influenced by one spirit. They went straight to the mind. It's called the law of suggestion. I'm going to suggest some stuff to you. And you're going to sum it up as the Lord say and prophecy. I'm going to pull something more down. You, don't, you have no idea that's an evil spirit telling you this. And then you're going to declare these things. Oh, I, I, I don't know, but the Lord already showed me. The Lord showed me that... Uh, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, uh, Minister is going to be the, this was back in the day, he's going to be the, 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 the Prime Minister again of the Bahamas. The Lord showed me that Donald Trump is going to win again. Now this was back in the time when they lose. So now that they lost and that prophecy didn't come to pass, now you see everything that I said to you. You heard something, more than likely, which kingdom did you hear it from? Which kingdom did you hear it from? So, with that said, right, I want us to go to 1 John, because I'm going to give you some instructions now. 1 John, chapter 4, verse 1. 1 John, chapter 4, verse 1, all right? 1 John, chapter 4, verse 1. Listen carefully. Beloved, uh-huh, talk to me. Believe, what? Not Every spirit. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Because Stanley, you're saying to me, there are multiple spirits out there, including the spirit of God. So he says, don't believe every spirit. So that means plenty of spirits are speaking. I mean, I, I, I'm no, 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 no genius, but common sense would tell me, if you said to me, do not, I must be careful and don't believe in every spirit. Not only does it say to me, from a forensic perspective, that there are multiple spirits, but it is also suggesting to me multiple spirits are speaking to me. 